448, Chapter 66 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1110. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 448, Where'd I Put That Seashell Necklace? This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. I, (laughs) giving a shout out to all the kids listening in the car as you drive around, I did a little aerial shout out there for them from Little Mermaid because my voice is coming and going. Thing two got bronchitis. I appear to have gotten his bronchitis. And so if I could just, you know, get that shell necklace that has the voice in it, I think I would be much better off. This morning I couldn't speak at all. And last night I was rapidly losing my voice. So this amount of voice is actually pretty darn good. And it's a good thing too, because we have a pretty exciting episode for you. First, Justin and I started our 1984 podcast. And uh, we started it with a live stream. Each time we start a new book, we're going to start it with a public live stream. And then the rest of the episodes will be over on Patreon. So you can follow links in the show notes or go to patreon.com slash brave new podcast, all one word. Or if you just want to listen to the first episode, you can go to brave new dot dot com and get to the show notes and the episode there. But to prevent you from having to do anything extra, Justin and I have decided to put a little teaser right here for you so you can get an idea of what it is like to listen to Brave New Podcast. Well, the same sort of thing in regards to um, April 4th, 1984, where Winston begins to write all this down. And the the horrific kind of videos everyone was watching, right? How did that make you feel? It's interesting because there was a an activity that I had wanted to make my kids in Southern California do. My kids in New York did not need this, but my kids in Southern California did. So I was teaching in 92, 93, 93, 94 in Southern California. And I had creative writing classes. And what I had wanted to do was take, I think it's a scene, it's either Total Recall or RoboCop. Because they all got, the high body count movies came out all at the same time. So Terminator, RoboCop, yeah. Total Recall, the original Total Recall. What I had wanted to do is there's a scene where there's a a line of cops, good guys, on an escalator. And they're obviously, if you're on an escalator, you can't go anywhere if bad Mm -hmm. things start to happen. And so they all get picked off. And what I had wanted to do was you, you watch them walk in. And I had wanted to have the kids focus on this one guy, the first guy out, and to stop the film right before all the bad stuff starts happening and have them watch it again just that section, and then write his morning. Sit down, take the next 20 minutes, write what his morning was like. From the moment he woke up until the moment he got there, what happened? Who did he talk to? What did he eat? Where did he go? How did he get to work? And and then I wanted to show them the rest of the clip and then have the bell ring. Wow. Because I really, really believed at the time, and I'm not sure how I feel now. I'm still, I'm, I'm still reflecting on this all this time later that the the way kids were not being socialized was putting them in a position where it was easier to be a casual bully. Not, not an active, like trying to pick fights bully, but the casual bully where you laugh when somebody gets hurt. Yeah. And that seemed to me to be very similar to the purposeful desensitization that was going on in in the party's decision to show these kind of movies. Plus, it's always the proles. It's the people who nobody cares about anyway. So Mm -hmm. it's like refugees. Why do we care? Exactly. It's not like they're real people. So for now, we'll record on Wednesdays, and we will get the audio out as soon as we can after that. Uh, We kind of have to get our sea legs under us and find the, the rhythm of adding this podcast into our already packed schedules. 
me doing Craftlet and Justin doing everything else for everybody else. So, <laughs> so Justin is doing yeoman service, and I'm so excited to be working with him. It's a lot of fun. Also this week, we had our first crafty chat in a couple of weeks, and there were many things that we shared that were uh, fun between the people in the chat window who had completed things and shared the pictures with me, or things that I stumbled across online. Someone shared with me the most adorable, tiny, tiny little crocheted chameleons. They're not traditional amigurumi. They are, they are rather unique. But the construction is rather interesting. And in the show notes, you'll find a link that will take you straight to the YouTube channel episode, the Crafty Chat episode, where you can both see them and hear what I'm saying about them. But the upshot is the construction seems to be, well, first off, mysterious because it was made by a Russian crocheter who doesn't publish patterns. All she does is sells these little guys off of her Etsy store. And while it looks like it is possible that she may have used pipe cleaners to help control the legs and the tail. It also looks like it might just be wrapped. It's not yarn. It looks like embroidery floss that she was using. So take a look and see what you think and leave comments in the comment section of the page at craftlit.com slash 448. I'm very curious to know what you think about the construction on these little guys. But on the picture, it's so adorable because she's got four on her hand, so one on each finger. and they're they're on her fingers. So they're pretty small and really, really cute. So go have a look, see if you can figure out how you think the construction was done. We have ideas, but we're not positive. So that was one of the fun things, just one of the many fun things that we shared on the Crafty Chat on Tuesday. Crafty Chats appear live on our YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash craftlit dash hyphen channel, craftlit dash channel. And that's how you get there. If you scroll down a little bit, you will see a upcoming live stream section and you will be able to see when the Crafty Chat's going to be. It's almost always Tuesdays at 1.30. If we don't start exactly at 1.30 Eastern, it's because of tech problems and we'll be there soon. Uh, but in the meantime, you can always chat in the chat window with all of the other awesome Craftlet listeners who are hanging out there and celebrating the cool things that they're making with each other. It's really, really become a, a fun part of my week getting a chance to, to hang out with, with actual people. Even if only virtually, it's nice to get to see. I'm using air quotes, everyone. The other cool thing that happened this week is I received a package in the mail from Julie Davis, Julie of Forgotten Classics podcast. Now, Julie, you may recall, is also the author of the Happy Catholic blog, and she's released another book in previous years, but she has a new one out now called Seeking Jesus in everyday life, prayers and reflections for getting closer. And I wanted to share with you just one of the many reviews that she has for this book. This book is a joyful pilgrimage to the Father, made with the most amazing companions, from Ambrose of Milan to Marshall McLuhan. As always, Julie Davis leads us forward in prayer by way of good books, good movies, good conversation, and even good food. Highly recommended. Mike Aquilina, author of the Fathers of the Church. And what's really, really lovely about the way that she's built the book is she has quotations on pages that are thematically organized. And then her own response or commentary on focusing you back towards Jesus using that text. And you know I'm not Catholic, but I, I thumbed through the book and I found some really lovely ones. And this one, this one is very much about Jesus, but I thought I would share it with you because I think the writing is beautiful and I didn't know of this person before. So, Jesus is as human as it gets. He got exhausted, took naps, although he had nowhere to lay his head, took baths, trimmed his beard, learned to walk and talk, and, as little babies are wont to do, squealed and squirmed with joy during mother-son playtime. We can laugh with the giggling, writhing Christ child because we know that this bee-tickled body is the same body that he will offer freely, out of love, to go hungry, to walk all up and down Israel, to preach the good news, to heal the sick and the blind, to suffer injustice, to be scourged, to be crucified, to die. And in the resurrection, this same body, this same humanity, has risen from the dead and has become all humanity's path to heaven. 
And that quote is from Brother Gabriel Toretta from a, it looks like a journal article called Did the Virgin Mary Tickle the Baby Jesus? from the Dominicana Journal. That's the kind of cool text you can expect Julie to turn you on to. Because if she can find God in the Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II, <laughs> she's going to be able to find God in lots of interesting places for you. So this is a signed copy of her book, which I am holding in my hand right now, and it is available to you. There is a raffle giveaway that is being held on the Craftlit website. Again, craftlit.com slash 448. Go to the page and you will see right above the, the book notes on the, the show notes list. We have the little crafty links for you. And then you'll see the information on how to get Julie's book for yourself. If you win it, great. If you don't win it, I'll provide a link to Amazon for you. But this one, this sucker is signed. So I'm very excited to be able to offer that to you and and get you excited about reading more from, from our good friend Julie Davis, because she's awesome. And now for our book talk. So, oh, so much has happened lately. First, we have to remember what happened at the end of our previous chapter, because it's been a little while now. Danglar had confronted Madame Danglar. He had kind of sent Debray on his way, and, and so they kind of had their big knockout true confessions moment for their marriage. Danglar knows about her baby with Viafor. It's unclear if, she, if he knows who she had the baby with, but he does know she had the baby. He also knows that her fortunes are completely tied up with his, and she knows it too. So not a happy family right now, but we pick up with the next day and Danglar. So that's where we're going to take place in time and space. The name of the chapter in the Victorian book is Matrimonial Projects. And the name in the new translation, the Robin Buss translation, is Marriage Plans. And neither of them seem to fit the whole chapter, but they both seem to fit more or less the end of the chapter. So don't let that throw you as you're, you're listening, because at first it's going to be what? But uh, a couple things to keep in mind as you listen. The first one is biblical. Uh, Genesis chapter 41 is Joseph of the Amazing Technical or Dream Code. Uh, when Joseph was imprisoned by Pharaoh, he, while he was stuck in the prison, uh, interpreted some of the prisoners' dreams, and he was absolutely accurate and successful. And eventually, a couple of years later, that paid off for him, and he gets brought up to divine what the Pharaoh's dream meant. He had a very specific dream, and his soothsayers, his magician guys, weren't able to do anything for him in that respect. So Pharaoh's kind of upset. Joseph comes before him, and Pharaoh said, I had a dream. There were seven fat, healthy cows who came out of the River Nile, followed by seven skinny, sickly, unhappy-looking cows that came out. And that dream was followed hard on by another one, which was seven healthy stalks of wheat. And that was followed by seven not very healthy stalks of wheat. And golly gee, what does that mean? You are going to hear Monte Cristo bring up seven fat cows and seven thin cows. And it is a total throwaway line. And when he says it, the meaning of it is completely ignored, hubris-like, by his discussion partner. Remember that the important part about Joseph's divination of the dream is that Seven fat cows, seven healthy stalks of wheat, was a symbol from God that Egypt was going to have seven years straight through of really great life. The plants were going to grow. The food was going to be abundant. Everything was going to be hunky-dory for seven whole years. And then, boom, very much in the winter is coming kind of way, you're going to get seven years of famine, real famine. Famine so bad that by the time you hit the end of it, no one will have remembered what it was like to live during those seven good years. Now, Joseph could have just ended it there and said, all right, that's the end of your dream. But instead, he goes on and says, and because of that, you need to use the seven good years to store grain and put food aside. Even though you have more than enough to eat, you could waste it, but don't. Set it aside make it possible for your people to get through the seven dark years. It's that part that's important. It's the saving it for a rainy day thing. 
that's important. So all you're going to get is fat cows, thin cows. But that, that moment is an important one. So that's number one. The second is the word parvenu. This is kind of like nouveau riche. It's based on a, a Latin term that became a French term eventually that means arrived. Somebody who has arrived economically and perhaps socially, but is maybe not completely accepted socially, like new money, nouveau riche. There's a bit of a negative connotation to the word. Nouveau riche definitely has the negative connotation. Parvenu has a slightly lighter weight negative connotation to it. But that whole concept of classes of money is going to play into one of the Count's ploys during today's chapter. You will hear him talking rather specifically about how he envisions the stratas of society, of financial, fiscal society. And it is really interesting to hear how he breaks it down as though he were doing it just to goad Danglar. I don't know how he could possibly have done that. <laughs> it's a mystery. And on that mysterious note, I will let you listen to this chapter. This is one chapter, chapter 66, Matrimonial Projects. Chapter 66, Matrimonial Projects. The day following this scene, at the hour the banker usually chose to pay a visit to Madame d'Anglard on his way to his office, his coupe did not appear. At this time, that is, about half-past twelve, Madame d'Anglard ordered her carriage and went out. d'Anglard, hidden behind a curtain, watched the departure he had been waiting for. He gave orders that he should be informed as soon as Madame d'Anglard appeared. But at two o'clock she had not returned. He then called for his horses, drove to the chamber, and inscribed his name to speak against the budget. From twelve to two o'clock, Danglars had remained in his study, unsealing his dispatches and becoming more and more sad every minute, heaping figure upon figure, and receiving, among other visits, one from Major Cavalcanti, who, as stiff and exact as ever, presented himself precisely at the hour named the night before, to terminate his business with the banker. On leaving the chamber, Danglars, who had shown violent marks of agitation during the sitting, and been more bitter than ever against the ministry, re-entered his carriage, and told the coachman to drive to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, numéro 30. Monte Cristo was at home. Only he was engaged with someone and begged to Danglars to wait for a moment in the drawing-room. While the banker was waiting in the anteroom, the door opened, and a man dressed as an abbé, and doubtless more familiar with the house than he was, came in and, instead of waiting, merely bowed, passed on to the farther apartments, and disappeared. A minute after the door by which the priest had entered reopened, and Monte Cristo appeared, Pardon me, said he, my dear baron, but one of my friends, the abbé Bussoni, whom you perhaps saw passed by, has just arrived in Paris. Not having seen him for a long time, I could not make up my mind to leave him sooner, so I hope this will be sufficient reason for my having made you wait. Nay, said Donglar, it is my fault. I have chosen a visit at a wrong time, and will retire. Not at all. On the contrary, be seated. But what is the matter with you? You look careworn. Really, you alarm me. A melancholy in a capitalist, like the appearance of a comet, presages some misfortune to the world. I have been in ill luck for several days, said Danglars, and I have heard nothing but bad news. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo. Have you had another fall at the Bourse? No, I am safe for a few days at least. I am only annoyed about a bankrupt of Trieste. Really? Does it happen to be Jacopo Manfredi? 
Exactly so. Imagine a man who has transacted business with me for I don't know how long to the amount of 800,000 or 900,000 francs during the year. Never a mistake or delay. A fellow who paid like a prince. Well, I was a million in advance with him, and now my fine Jacopo Manfredi suspends a payment. Really? It is an unheard of fatality. I draw upon him for 600,000 francs. My bills are returned unpaid, and more than that, I hold bills of exchange signed by him to the value of 400,000 francs payable at his correspondence in Paris at the end of this month. Today is the 30th. I present them, but my correspondent has disappeared. This, with my Spanish affair, made a pretty end to the month. Then you really lost by that affair in Spain? Yes, only 700,000 francs out of my cash box, nothing more. Why, how could you have made such a mistake? Such an old stager? Oh, it is all my wife's fault. She dreamed Don Carlos had returned to Spain. She believes in dreams. It is magnetism, she says, and when she dreams a thing, it is sure to happen, she assures me. On this conviction, I allow her to speculate. She, having her bank and her stockbroker, she speculated and lost. It is true she speculates with her own money, not mine. Nevertheless, you can understand that when 700,000 francs leave the wife's pocket, the husband always finds it out. But do you mean to say you have not heard of this? Why, the thing has made a tremendous noise. Yes, I heard of it spoken, but I did not know the details, and then no one can be more ignorant than I am of the affairs in the bourse. Then you do not speculate? I? How could I speculate when I already have so much trouble in regulating my income? I should be obliged, beside my steward, to keep a clerk and a boy, but touching these Spanish affairs, I think that the Baroness did not dream the whole of the Don Carlos matter. The papers said something about it, did they not? Then uh, you believe the papers? I? Not the least in the world. Only I fancied that the honest messager was an exception to a rule, and that it only announced telegraphic dispatches. Well, that's what puzzles me, replied Donglar. The news of the return of Don Carlos was brought by telegraph. So that, said Monte Cristo, you have lost nearly one million seven hundred thousand francs this month. Not nearly, indeed, that is exactly my loss. Diable, said Monte Cristo compassionately. It is a hard blow for a third-rate fortune. Third-rate, said Danglars, rather humble. What do you mean by that? Certainly, continued Monte Cristo. I make three assortments in fortune. First-rate, second-rate, and third-rate fortunes. I call those first-rate, which are composed of treasures one possesses under one's hand, such as mines, lands, and funded property, in such states as France, Austria, and England, provided these treasures and property form a total of about a hundred millions. I call those second-rate fortunes that are gained by manufacturing enterprises, joint stock companies, vice-royalties, and principalities, not drawing more than one million five hundred thousand francs, the whole forming a capital of about fifty millions. Finally, I call those third-rate fortunes, which are composed of a fluctuating capital, dependent upon the will of others, 
or upon chances which a bankruptcy involves or a false telegram shakes, such as banks, speculations of the day, in fact, all operations under the influence of greater or less mischances, the whole bringing in a real or fictitious capital of about fifteen millions. I think this is about your position, is it not? Confound it, yes, replied Donglar. The result, then, of six more such months as this would be to reduce the third-rate house to despair. Oh, said Donglar, becoming very pale, how you are running on. Let us imagine seven such months, continued Monte Cristo in the same tone. Tell me, have you ever thought that seven times one million seven hundred thousand francs make nearly twelve millions? No, you have not. Well, you are right, for if you indulge in such reflections, you would never risk your principle, which is to the speculator what the skin is to civilized man. We have our clothes, some more splendid than others. This is our credit. But when a man dies, he has only his skin. In the same way, on retiring from business, you have nothing but your real principal of about five or six millions, at the most. For third-rate fortunes are never more than a fourth of what they appear to be, like the locomotive on a railway, the size of which is magnified by the smoke and steam surrounding it. Well... Out of the five or six millions which form your real capital, you have just lost nearly two millions, which must, of course, in the same degree, diminish your credit and fictitious fortune to follow out my simile. Your skin has been opened by bleeding, and this, if repeated three or four times, will cause death. So pay attention to it, my dear Monsieur Donglar. Do you want money? Do you wish me to lend you some? What a bad calculator you are, exclaimed Anglar, calling to his assistance all his philosophy and dissimulation. I have made money at the same time by speculations which have succeeded. I have made up the loss of blood by nutrition. I lost a battle in Spain. I have been defeated in Trieste, but my naval army in India will have taken some galleons, and my Mexican pioneers will have discovered some mine. Very good, very good, but the wound remains and will reopen at the first loss. No, for I am only embarked in certainties, replied Donglar, with the air of a mountebank sounding his own praises. To involve me, Three governments must crumble to dust. Well, such things have been. That there should be a famine. Recollect the seven fat and the seven lean kine. Or that the sea should become dry as in the days of Pharaoh, and even then my vessels would become caravans. So much the better. I congratulate you, my dear Monsieur Donglar, said Monte Cristo. I see I was deceived, and that you belong to the class of second rate fortunes. I think I may aspire to that honour, said Donglar with a smile, which reminded Monte Cristo of the sickly moons which bad artists are so fond of daubing into their pictures of ruins. But while we are speaking of business, Donglar added, pleased to find an opportunity of changing the subject, tell me what I am to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti. Give him money. If he is recommended to you, and the recommendation seems good. Excellent. He presented himself this morning with a bond of forty thousand francs, Payable at sight on you, signed by Busoni, and returned by you to me, with your endorsement, of course. I immediately counted him over the forty banknotes. Monte Cristo nodded his head in token of assent. But that is not all, continued Donglar. 
He has opened an account with my house for his son. May I ask how much he allows the young man? Uh, five thousand francs per month. Sixty thousand francs per year. I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanti to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousand more, do not advance it. The father will never repay it. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. They are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but nevertheless, mind you hold to the terms of the agreement. Would you not trust the Cavalcanti? I? Oh, I would advance six millions on his signature. I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is. I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere major. And you would have flattered him, for certainly, as you say, he has no manner. The first time I saw him, he appeared to me like an old lieutenant, who had grown mouldy under the epaulets. But all the Italians are the same. They are like old Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendour. The young man is better, said Danglars. Yes, a little nervous, perhaps. But upon the whole, he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why? Because you met him at my house. Just after his introduction into the world, as they told me, he has been travelling with a very severe tutor and had never been to Paris before. Ah, I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves, do they not? asked Danglars carelessly. They like to unite their fortunes. It is usual, certainly, but Cavalcanti is an original who does nothing like other people. I cannot help thinking that he has brought his son to France to choose a wife. Do you think so? I am sure of it. And you have heard his fortune mentioned? Nothing else was talked of. Only some said he was worth millions, and others that he did not possess a farthing. And what is your opinion? I ought not to influence you, because it is only my own personal impression. Well, and it is that... Uh, my opinion is that all these old podestas, those ancient condottieri, for the Cavalcanti, have commanded armies and governed provinces. My opinion, I say, is that they have buried their millions in corners, the secret of which they have transmitted only to their eldest sons, who have done the same from generation to generation, and the proof of this is seen in their yellow and dry appearance, like the Florins of the Republic, which, from being constantly gazed upon, have become reflected in them. Certainly, said Danglars, and this is further supported by the fact of their not possessing an inch of land. Very little, at least. I know of none which Cavalcanti possesses, excepting his palace in Lucca. Ah, he has a palace? said Danglars, laughing. Come, that is something. Yes, and more than that. He lets it to the Minister of Finance while he lives in a simple house. Oh, as I told you before, I think the old fellow is very close. Come, you do not flatter him. I scarcely know him. I think I have seen him three times in my life. All I know relating to him is through Busoni and, and himself. He was telling me this morning that, tired of letting his property lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead nation, he wished to find a method, either in France or England, of multiplying his millions. But remember that though I place great confidence in Busoni, I am not responsible for this. 
Never mind. Accept my thanks for the client you have sent me. It is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers, and my cashier was quite proud of it when I explained to him who the Cavalcanti were. By the way, this is merely a simple question. When this sort of people marry their sons, do they give them any fortune? Oh, that depends upon circumstances. I know an Italian prince, rich as a gold mine, one of the noblest families in Tuscany, who, when his sons married, according to his wish, gave them millions, and when they married against his consent, merely allowed them thirty crowns a month. Should Andrea marry according to his father's views, he will perhaps give him one, two, or three millions, for example, supposing it were the daughter of a banker. He might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son. Then again, if he disliked his choice, the major takes the key, double locks his coffer, and Master Andrea would be obliged to live like his sons of a Parisian family by shuffling cards or rattling dice. Ah, that poor boy will find out some Bavarian or Peruvian princess. He'll want a crown and an immense fortune. No, these grand lords on the other side of the Alps frequently marry into plain families, like Jupiter. They like to cross the race. But do you wish to marry André, my dear Monsieur Donglar, that you are asking so many questions? Ma foi, said Donglar. It would not be a bad speculation, I fancy, and you know I am a speculator. You are not thinking of Mademoiselle Donglar, I hope. You would not like poor Andrea to have his throat cut by Albert. Albert, repeated Donglar, shrugging his shoulders. Ah, well, he would care very little about it, I think. But he is betrothed to your daughter, I believe. Well, Monsieur de Morcerf and I have talked about this marriage. But Madame de Morcerf and Albert... You do not mean to say that it would not be a good match? Indeed. I imagine that Mademoiselle Donglar is as good as Monsieur de Morcerf. Mademoiselle Donglar fortune will be great, no doubt, especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes. Oh, I do not mean her fortune only. But tell me, what? Why did you not invite Monsieur and Madame de Morcerf to your dinner? I did so, but he excused himself on account of Madame de Morcerf, being obliged to go to Dieppe for the benefit of sea air. "'Yes, yes,' said Donglar, laughing. "'It would do her a great deal of good.' "'Why so?' "'Because it is the air she always breathed in her youth.' Monte Cristo took no notice of this ill-natured remark. "'But still, if Albert be not so rich as Mademoiselle Donglar, said the Count, "'you must allow that he is a fine name.' "'So he has.' but I like mine as well. Certainly, your name is popular, and it does honour to the title they have adorned it with, but you are too intelligent not to know that, according to a prejudice, too firmly rooted to be exterminated, a nobility which dates back five centuries is worth more than one that can only reckon twenty years. And for this very reason said Donglar with a smile which he tried to make sardonic. I prefer Monsieur Andrea Calvalcanti to Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Still, I should not think that the Morcerfs would yield to the Cavalcanti. The Morcerfs. Stay, my dear Count, said Donglar. You are a man of the world, are you not? I think so. And you understand the heraldry? A little. Well, look at my coat of arms. 
It is worth more than Morcerf's. Why so? Because though I am not a baron by birth, my real name is at least Donglar. Well, what then? While his name is not Morcerf. How? Not Morcerf? Not the least in the world. Go on. I have been made a baron so that I actually am one. He made himself a count so that he is not one at all. Impossible. Listen, my dear count. Monsieur de Morcerf has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcerf was a mere fisherman. And then he was called? Fernand. Only Fernand? Fernand Mondego. You are sure? Pardieu, I have bought enough fish of him to know his name. Then why do you think of giving your daughter to him? Because Fernand and Danglars, being both parvenus, both having become noble, both rich, are about equal in worth, excepting that there have been certain things mentioned of him that were never said of me. What? Oh, nothing. Ah, yes, what you tell me recalls to mine something about the name of Fernand Mondego. I have heard that name in Greece. In conjunction with the affairs of Ali Pasha? Exactly so. This is the mystery, said Donglar. I acknowledge I would have given anything to find it out. It would be very easy, if you much wished it. How so? Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. I should think so. At Yanina? Everywhere. Well, write to your correspondent in Yanina, and ask him what part was played by a Frenchman named Fernand Mandego in the catastrophe of Ali Tepelini. You are right, exclaimed Angla, rising quickly. I will write today. Do so. I will. And if you should hear of anything very scandalous, I will communicate it to you. You will oblige me. Donglar rushed out of the room and made but one leap into his coop. End of chapter 66 Okay, so here's the question for you. <laughs> 206-350-1642 or go to speakpipe.com slash craftlit and tell me why do you think Danglar went to Monte Cristo's after he'd signed up and gone to speak against Debray, I imagine, uh, in government, he goes, he goes to Monte Cristo's. They're not, they're not even really friends, right? I have a theory. I certainly don't think it's the theory though. So I would be thrilled to know why you think he did that. Because there were a couple of really interesting things that Dunglar dropped during this conversation. One, I think ties really nicely to Genesis 41. He clearly knows that his wife is getting her information from Debray, but he doesn't say that to Monte Cristo. Instead, he says she has dreams. Chances are Monte Cristo knows what's really going on, but, but she has dreams, just like Pharaoh. Hmm. Time of feast, time of famine. Interesting ripples there. So that's one. And then there were two places in the new translation that I thought the, the new translation really did make stuff, if not clearer, at least made a little more sense. It's, it's not so much that it's a, a difference in, in crystallinity as it is. It's just easier to understand in a modern, modern eye. When Denglar mentions Morcerf and where Madame Morcerf is, the Count says, uh, I did invite her, but he said he was, oh, I did, I did invite Morcerf, but he said he was going too deep with Madame de Morcerf, who was advised to take some sea air. My word, yes, said Danglars with a laugh. 
It must be good for her. Why? Because it is the air she breathed when she was young. Now, in the Victorian text, the next line makes it sound like what Denglar said was crossing a line somehow, that it was, it was an insult or it was a, it kind of cast aspersions on her character. In the modern translation, this makes a little bit more sense to me. It's Monte Cristo let the illusion pass without comment. But when all is said and done, he continued, while Albert may not be as rich as Mademoiselle Denglar, you cannot deny that he bears a fine name. So he lets the comment, he lets the illusion pass, and he doesn't say anything about it because, oof, that one would be hard and painful. But then it goes on to that conversation about heraldry. And again, I felt like the Victorian language kind of obscured some of the import of what was really going on. And actually, the new translation, I thought, is kind of beautiful writing in small. Monte Cristo says, you can't deny that Albert bears a fine name. And Denglar says, yes, but I like mine too. Monte Cristo says, agreed, your name is a popular one, and it ennobled the title with which they sought to ennoble it. But you are too intelligent not to realize that, according to certain prejudices which are too deeply ingrained for them to be eradicated, a title five centuries old is better than one of only twenty years. And that, said Denglar, with an attempt at a sardonic smile, is why I should prefer Monsieur Andrea Cavalcante to Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Yes, I imagine that the Morcerfs do not cede to the Cavalcantis. The Morcerfs? Tell me, my dear Count, you are a noble man, aren't you? I think so. And well-versed in heraldry? A little. Well, consider the paint on my coat of arms. It's drier than that of Morcerfs. How can that be? Because even though I am not a baron by birth, I am at least called Danglar. So, while he is not called Morcerf. What, he's not called Morcerf? No, not in the slightest. Come now. I was made a baron by someone, so that is what I am. He made himself a count, so that is what he is not. I loved that image of the paint on my heraldry is drier than Morcerf's, because at least Denglar has been his name his whole life. We know that Farnand, who became Morcerf, that something happened... And boy, did we start to get hints of that at the end of this chapter with the Ali Pasha stuff. You know, go find out what was really going on when he got his title or when he did whatever he did that qualified him to buy a title. And that sounds like it doesn't bode well for anyone who gets in, gets in the count's way, as it were. So we've got new chess pieces on the board. I mean, we've certainly heard about Morsef and the uh, Ali Pasha story, but now we have new players entering that field. Danglar seems to be getting involved and also not heeding warnings that are being given to him so overtly. He's also attracted to Cavalcante, Andrea Cavalcante, who we know is just a horrible kid, Benedetto. And we know that all things, all pasts aside, Albert is at least honorable. He's a good kid. He is the product of a sad marriage, not the one that anybody would have wanted to have happen ultimately, but Cavalcanti, we know, is a complete fabrication on the part of the Count. So, hmm, there's stuff percolating and happening here. Now, before I let you go, we got a really fun voicemail from Anne Blanton. That's A.T. Blanton on Facebook. And I will let her voice be the last one you hear today because I have no voice. So here we go with the voicemail from A.T. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is Anne again. You did not talk about Tilbury and the Grand Sophie. You did not. You did not. You did not. I, oh, my God. I love the Grand Sophie. That is my very favorite George J. Hayer book, and I loved that character. I loved Sophie. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I'm glad you liked the book, too. Thank you, Heather. You just made me laugh. Oh, my God. I'm just going to be, I have to, I have to call my sister who is also a huge craft li listener and, but that is her favorite Georgette Hire book too. So thank you very much. You've just made my day. And when Susan hears that, it will have made her day too. Thanks again, Heather. Bye. Thank you for keeping craft lit going for 11 years. That's right. April 26, 2017 marked our 11th year anniversary. It wouldn't have been possible without listeners like you who've supported the show. 
Thank you. If you like getting free annotated audiobooks, please visit us at patreon.com slash craftlet to support the show. You can also find and listen to Craftlet at all of the places you expect to find podcasts. That is craftlet.com, craftlet.libsyn.com, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and our own dedicated app available for smart devices. Thank you so much for your support of the show. And don't forget, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thank you.